بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم تسليم على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وشرعنا مع شر الإسلام إن لنا من الإناية ركنا غير منهدم لما دع الله دعين لطاعته بأكرم الرسل كنا أكرم الأمم الحمد لله Glad tidings to us O Assembly of Muslims because we have a pillar of solicitude that will never ever break that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the one who calls us to his obedience with, uh, and called him the most noble of all of the messengers that we were the most noble of all communities the tongue should never tire from the mention of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu In fact, that the more that our Iman strengthens, the more sweet that it becomes. Every time that we mention his blessed name sallallahu there is a renewal of meaning that penetrates the depths of the heart. And the light, when it strikes the heart, that indeed is something very, very sweet. These gatherings are like mawa'id, that they are that spiritual buffets that you and I come together and collectively partake in. And there is nothing more important for us to learn, to swim in the meanings of remembrance, and to have our hearts feel enriched by them. But the heart needs to be habituated and conditioned in order to find joy in them. It is very easy for us to be trapped in the realm of the sensory and to be like everybody else that is around us walking on the face of this earth, having them be concerned with primarily worldly concerns. The believer, though, is different. Our hearts are attached to something different. Our hearts are meant to be celestial by nature. To the degree that we let the nafs pollute our heart will be to the degree that we let it constrain the part of our heart that relates to the ruh. And the nature of the ruh is that it wants to ascend to its homeland, which is in the divine presence of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we only to know what exists by way of human potentiality and what these gatherings are meant to unlock within ourselves, that it would be very, very different. Where we only to know the beauty in these teachings of our Prophet Sallallahu and how we are the ones that will benefit from that, and we are the ones that will be fulfilled from them at the very depth of our being, and by extension, of course, at the realm of the psychological and emotional, and even, of course, at the level of the physical. If you are enriched deeply at the level of the spirit, deep within yourself, then that naturally, through a trickle-down effect, it is going to affect every other dimension of you. So these are gatherings that we need to cling to, and these are moments that we need to appreciate, and we need to venerate into esteem. And all of the various sha'ir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sacred symbols of this religion, if we have exaltation in our hearts for them, it is a sign that we are people of taqwa, that we are mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and putting everything in its proper place. Ta'zim, exaltation, magnification, esteem, respect, is one of the greatest signs that we've learned something of how to have adab, manners before our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, in manners with what he commanded us to have manners within his creation to baraka wa ta'ala. And as you and I go throughout life, no doubt, we will be exposed to a lot. And anyone that lives a long period of time will see a lot. And the Prophet sallallahu told this to the companions, Man any of all, those of you that will live, that you are going to see all different types of things. And then the Prophet left guidance behind Sallallahu for how it is that we need to be in relation to everything that it is that we will see. Everything will be different as we grow up, we move through those teenage years, we enter into our 20s, we go through various changes then, then we go through changes as we get into our late 20s, we go through changes and we get into our late 30s, we go through changes when we get into our late 40s, the various stages or atwar of life. But what it is, we want every single stage of our life and all of the sub-stages to be connected to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the most beautiful sarawat, one of our teachers, Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala Sayyidina Muhammadan, that nurik al-sari wa madidik al-jari wa jma'ni bihi fi kulli atwari. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us and unite us with him in all of the various stages of our life. 
so that everything that it is that we go through, everything that it is that we experience throughout life, it's connected to the Prophet Sallallahu If we go through tribulation, it's connected to him and how he that experienced tribulation, how he responded. If we go through times of prosperity, that it's connected to him and we experience that in exemplified traits of Ubutiya in the way that he did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and every other possible situation in which we can find guidance of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and most of us here are familiar faces. These are things that you and I do day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out. And this is something that is beautiful. This is something that you and I want to live upon, and this is something that you and I want to die upon. We don't want these gatherings to have a shelf life and for us just to attend them and to think that they're only important for part of our life. You and I want to experience these gatherings and deem them to be important throughout our lives. And this is something that we want to nurture in our children and to nurture in our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren to appreciate the importance of the remembrance of Allah and Nahida al-Dhikr and especially on the special night later to Jummah. This is something that you and I should set in our minds from now until the day that we meet Allah wa ta'ala. Laylatul to Jummah is a time and a night for dhikr. This is a night to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a night where from Salat al-Maghrib all the way until Salat al-Fajr is that there is a caller that calls out, is there anyone that has a need such that I may take care of that need? Is there anyone asking for anything such that I may grant them what is that they're asking? Is there anyone seeking forgiveness such that I may forgive them? Right now as we speak, this door is open for our needs to be taken care of, for our sins to be forgiven, for anything it is that we are asking for, for it to be granted to us were we only to perceive the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look forward to these times. Later to Jummah and then the day that follows it is a day that you and I should look forward to throughout the week. And Imam al-Sha'rani mentions radiallahu anhu is that the righteous used to wait for the time between the prayers, because we know this is a time that dua is answered, that he would wait for the time before, between the adhan and the iqama, to present their prayers to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to present their needs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, they knew how to live, they knew how to return back to the Lord and how it is that they needed to be. And of all of the things that we can supplicate for and ask for, especially in relation to our close brothers and sisters that Allah Ta'ala has blessed us to establish a relationship with. The people of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala mentioned there are four things specifically that you should make du'a for, for your close brothers and sisters. Four things. Of course, anything good you can make du'a for them. But these four things are at the heart of the entire matter. This is the crux of the entire matter. And they are istiqama, thabat, al wafa bil ahad, and a husn al khatima. These four things are the greatest four things that you can ask for people that are close to you. And the first is istiqama, which we all, of course, know is uprightness, rectitude, persevering in one's deen. And we know that this is something that is not easy to have. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in, there are some indications that this is what gave our blessed Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his blessed gray hairs. Fastaqim kama umirt. Remain upright as you have been commanded to do, as you've com been commanded to be, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uprightness is not something that is easy. And Ultimately, as our Lord says, that in relation to that those that he bestows his favor upon, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they, those who say, Rabbuna thumma staqamu, those who say, our Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they remain upright. What does that uprightness look like practically in our lives? As we go through these various stages, we find ourselves adhering to the five daily prayers. That is a staple part of our practice. When we know that the very best of the A'mal, the very best of all actions according to our Prophet is prayer in the first part of the time. 
how are you and I with prayer? How are you and I in relation to establishing the prayer, in fulfilling the prayer, in realizing the benefits of the prayer? And we know that human beings by nature, that we have been created impatient, is that we are very quick to get out of our comfort zone if the smallest little thing happens to us. And Allah Tabarakwada says, Human beings have been created impatient. And look at the what Allah Tabarakwada says. If we are touched, if human beings are touched, even the slightest bit of shar, of, of evil, of harm, of difficulty, jazua, we tend to panic and we become distressed. This slightest little thing happens to us is that we might have a rock in our shoe and not be able to concentrate. Is that we might have a slight little rash and we are irritable the entire day. The smallest little thing happens that our water heater breaks down or that there's a fly in the house and it's like qiyama, the tiniest little thing that makes us bent out of shape that we tend to panic and we tend to lose patience and then we tend to that respond that irascibly and if they are touched by something good the slightest amount of good comes to us we tend to withhold and become miserly and to only want it for ourselves or to attribute it to ourselves or to claim that it was from something that we've earned or something that we are entitled to but there is an exception to these traits that we won't say necessarily that they're from human nature but human beings are prone to them if that we do not establish religion in our lives because Allah Ta'ala then goes on to say except those who pray those who are consistent in their prayers, day in and day out. The greatest regulating force of the believer are the five daily prayers that you and I establish in our lives. So we need to always remind ourselves, how are we praying those five daily prayers? What is the state of our heart in those prayers? When are we praying them? How are they praying them? Are we praying them in congregation? What are we wearing when we pray them? Do we give it its due right? Or are we, that because we have to go, that we quickly rush to pray and then send salams and whoop, get right up and then head out? Prayer is of, that it's for our own benefit. Prayer does not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the ones that benefit from it. And this is just one of many examples of what it means to have istiqama. Because just as it means in terms of doing, it also means in terms of refraining resisting the urges as we go through the various stages of our life we all zuhid is not a sunnah of the past and just because we live in the silicon valley wherever we live in the united states of america or in the time in which we live and our prophet prophesied that money was going to become widespread in the end of time we knew that this is something that was going to happen but despite the ability, because despite the fact that we have the ability to do something, doesn't mean that we should actually do it. Learning to cut back, learning to detach ourselves from the world in which we live, especially as we go through the various stages of our life, this is critical. So the first thing that we can supplicate for our own selves and for our close brothers and sisters is to have istiqama. You and I are all in need of this istiqama. And then the second thing, is the bat. This relates to istiqamah, but it's slightly different. And the bat is to remain firm. The bat is to remain principled. The bat is to resist the urge to the judge in a way that somehow you're compromising your integrity. And one of the greatest traits of all is to have what is called al insaf min nafsik. Insaf min nafsik. And this means is that never do you expect of others 
what you don't already expect from your own self. Al-insaf min nafsik is that you know what it is that you're going through and you're working on your own self. And you have realistic expectations in relation to other people that you are with. And all it takes is to have a few children for you start to realize and you see some of the not so good traits of yours appearing in your children and then you get upset with them and then you catch yourself like, ooh, he or she learned that from me. That's because of something that is that I do. And it's not fair for us to that drill them when we know that it's something that you and I actually, that we're the cause of. And in Sofman of Sik, we have to that know that we do things and we can't expect other people to do those same thing, not do those same things that we're doing or to do things that we are not doing. We have to maintain that balance. But the bat is to remain principled. And ultimately, when we say principled, that means that in any given moment, there is simultaneously a theological, legal, and spiritual response that we have to have. And the more that we're rooted in the realities of is Iman, Islam, and Ihsan, the more that we'll be able to do that. What is meant by that? In any given moment, our theology, and this is why we want the haqiqa to tawheed. You need to study the books of theology, of course. And you need to understand the coherence of Islam. And you need to that buttress your faith with rational proofs. All of that is important. But you, we also need to experience theology. And the way that we do that is whatever happens, we see as being from Allah. And we challenge ourselves to reflect what name or names and attributes of Allah Ta'ala are manifesting in the moment. And how should I be as an abd before this name that is manifesting? Just as there is a legal response. Never can we do anything outside the sharia of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu we have to know the ruling in relation to everything that is that we do. And this is one of the most important. This requires a lot of knowledge. And this is one of the ways that we can actively combat the compartmentalization of religion that is so widespread in our time, where we relegate religion solely to the time of the masjid. No, we have to know how to interact with our wealth. We have to know how to, that the legal rulings in relation to marriage, in relation to that buying and selling in relation to our careers, in relation to borrowing money, in relation to that actually giving someone money, in relation to accepting gifts, in relation to having debts. All of these matters have fiqh, related, fiqh that relates to them. And we cannot think that fiqh just relates to salah. Fiqh relates to every single aspect of our life. There is a legal ruling whether we can do something or we can't do something, or there's shades after that based upon the various ahkam of the sharia, just as there is a spiritual dimension as well to everything that it is that we do. Sincerity before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the state of our heart, what should be in the heart, what do we do when someone praises, what do we do when someone criticizes, what do we do when we're happy, what do we do when we're sad? All of these different conflicting states that we go through, there is simultaneously a theological, legal, and spiritual response in thabat is to remain firm upon all of that throughout our lives. There's no situation that we're in save we are firm and we can't waver. Just as Thabat also relates to knowing how to protect ourselves from fitan. And again, this requires knowledge. We have to read what our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and understand the time in which we live and the way that the carpet is pulled from underneath the feet of the believers. The bat means is that we are weary of the various trials and tribulations of our time and that we know how to protect ourselves from them. And then the third is al-wafa bil ahd where we are faithful to the covenant that we have taken with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that covenant that we've taken with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to believe in him and to obey him. And al wafa bil ahad is to recognize that responsibility that has been placed upon our shoulders that was shown to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. And that they were that fearful of it. And they did not 
assume this trust, it was the human being that assumed it. That should be heavy. And to the degree that we understand the severity and the seriousness of that matter is the degree to which we will then, that as we transition from this world into the next world experience, the hereafter, the more we realize how serious that is. This whole affair is about wafa, fulfilling that trust, being faithful to the trust that we all took to our, with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala in the pre-earthly realm. We should ask that Allah Ta'ala blesses our fellow brothers and sisters with this, that they have istiqama, that they have thabat, is that they have a wafa bin ahad, and everything that Allah Ta'ala gives them, everything that is that they experience, that they remain in a state of obedience and servitude to Allah Ta'ala and to fulfill that trust. And we share this faith with as many people as we possibly can. And the final trait that we should be asking for or matlab rather, is husn al-khatima. Asking Allah for our close brothers and sisters to grant them a husn al-khatima, a good seal when it comes to death. And this is what it is all about. Every moment that we live ideally should be in preparation for that, but of course we're in states of heedlessness. So at least the majority of the moment should be lived in preparation for that. And if that's not possible or that's not our reality, at least some of the moments of our life should be lived for those moments. Because you never ever know what it is that you're going to do that's going to lead to the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the greatest things that we can do is to spend our time learning this deen and disseminating it. And we had read recently this incredibly beautiful statement of Abu Dhar. And it's mentioned in that the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. And he said that were I to be laid down and someone to have a sword put on the back of my neck, and from the time that it would take to lift that sword and then chop my head off, that I have an ability to convey a word that I heard from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I would have done so. And look at this metaphor that he's given. Is that you're at the very end of your life, is it how long would that take for someone to put the sword on the back of the neck and then it's a very short period of time. He said that were I be, to be able to convey just a word of the Prophet Sallallahu that I learned from in that short time, which might be two or three seconds, that I would do so. This was their hirs. This was how eager they were to convey the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi were we only to know how important it is and how much people are in need of it, this is exactly what it is that you and I would do and this is how it is that you and I would live because every single one of those sunnahs that we bring into our life is increasing the chance for you and I to die in a good state with a husn al-khatima. And then not only is there what is called a husn al-khatima, there's what is called a kamal husn al-khatima. There's also called a perfect good seal. And these are people that die on Laylatul to Juma. These are people that die in sujood. These are people that die in the blessed month of Ramadan. These are people that go to that Mecca and Mukarrama and Medina Munawrawa and Munawwara and to die in these special places. These are people who die in an act of obedience. And that there are people that are like this. And you see these stories coming out from all of these people. May Allah have mercy upon all of their souls that died in this difficult earthquake that, that took place recently. And that one of the clips that is going around is, is someone, is that when he was being pulled out of the rubble, that he and his son, they smelled, they'd been in there for days, but there was no foul smell to their bodies. Um, they said that actually it smelled like musk. And then they started to look into who this was, and they found that this was someone who used to praise the Prophet Sallallahu in poetry. He used to write poetry about the Prophet Sallallahu and that he and his son was similar to him, is that they didn't smell bad at all. On the contrary, they smelled like musk. And these are not fake stories, that these types of things are possible. And the more that you and I, that perfume our souls with the mentioning of the Prophet and with his sunnah, 
the more then that it will exude from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and bless us in all of our affairs and to keep us together and bless all of us, Ya Rahman Rahmin, with the highest degree of istiqama and of thabat and bless us all to fulfill the covenant that we've taken with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and to die in the very best of states after long lives in the obedience of Allah. And just as He's gathered us here in this dunya and He's continually gathered us here in this dunya year after year, may He gather us ultimately in the hereafter, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, and to not leave any of us behind, not any of our loved ones or any of those that are close to us or our family members or friends and anyone in the community, Ya Arhamur Rahimin, and may we all be entered into the, the Hima in sanctuary of Sayyidina Rasulullah and to receive his Shafa'a. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa alayhi wa sallam, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.